All right, I'm going to read chapters four through six of The Tiger Rising. Sistine was in Rob's sixth grade homeroom class. Mrs. Soames made her stand up and introduce herself. My name, she said in her gravelly voice, is Sistine Bailey. She stood at the front of the room in her pink dress. And all the kids stared at her with open mouths as if she had just stepped off a spaceship from another planet. Rob looked down at his desk. He knew not to stare at her. He started working on a drawing of the tiger. What a lovely name, said Mrs. Soames. Thank you, said Sistine. Patrice Wilkins, who sat in front of Rob, snorted and then giggled and then covered her mouth. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Sistine said, home of the Liberty Bell. And I hate the South because the people in it are ignorant. And I'm not staying here in Lister. My father's coming to get me next week. She looked around the room defiantly. Well, said Mrs. Soames, thank you very much for introducing yourself, Sistine Bailey. You may take your seat before you put your foot in your mouth any farther. The whole class laughed at that. Rob looked up just as Sistine sat down. She glared at him. Then she stuck her tongue out at him. Him. He shook his head and went back to his drawing. He sketched out the tiger, but what he wanted to do was whittle it in wood. His mother had shown him how to whittle, how to take a piece of wood and make it come alive. She taught him when she was sick. He sat on the edge of the bed and watched her tiny white hands closely. Don't jiggle that bed, his father said. Your mom is in a lot of pain. He ain't hurting me, Robert, his mother said. Don't get all tired out with that wood, his father said. It's all right, his mother said. I'm just teaching Rob some things I know. But she said she didn't have to teach him much. His mother told him he already knew what to do. His hands knew. That's what she said. Rob, said the teacher, I need you to go to the principal's office. Rob didn't hear her. He was working on the tiger, trying to remember what his eyes looked like. Robert, Mrs. Soames said. Robert Horton. Rob looked up. Robert was his father's name. Robert was what his mother had called his father. Mr. Felmer wants to see you in his office. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am, said Rob. He got up and took his picture of the tiger and folded it up and put it in the back pocket of his shorts. On his way out of the classroom, Jason Utmere tripped him and said, see you later, retard. And Sistine looked up at him with her tiny black eyes. She saw, shot him a look of pure hate. Chapter five. The principal's office was small and dark and smelled like pipe tobacco. The secretary looked up at Rob when he walked in. Go right on back, she said, nodding her big blonde head of hair. He's waiting for you. Rob, said Mr. Felmer, when Rob stepped into his office. Yes, sir, said Rob. Have a seat, Mr. Felmer said, waving his hand at the orange plastic chair in front of his desk. Rob sat down. Mr. Felmer cleared his throat. He patted the piece of hair that was combed over his bald head. He cleared his throat again. Rob, we're a bit worried, he finally said. Rob nodded. This was how Mr. Felmer began all his talks with Rob. He was always worried, worried that Rob did not interact with the other students, worried that he did not communicate, worried that he wasn't doing well in any way at school. It's about your uh, legs. Yes, your legs. Have you been putting that medicine on them? Yes, sir, said Rob. He didn't look at Mr. Felmer. He stared instead at the paneled wall behind the principal's head. It was covered with an astonishing array of framed pieces of paper, certificates and diplomas and thank you letters. May I uh, look? Asked Mr. Felmer. He got up from his chair and came halfway around his desk and stared at Rob's legs. Well, sir, he said after a minute. He went back behind his desk and sat down. He folded his hands together and cracked his knuckles. He cleared his throat. Here's the situation, Rob. Some of the parents, I won't mention any names, are worried that what you've got there might be contagious. Contagious meaning something that the other students could possibly catch. Mr. Felmer cleared his throat again, and he stared at Rob. Tell me the truth, son, he said. 
have you been using that medicine you told me about? The stuff that Dr. and Jacksonville gave you? Have you been putting that on? Yes, sir, said Rob. Well, said Mr. Felmer, let me tell you what I think. Let me be upfront and honest with you. I think it might be a good idea if we had you stay home for a few days. What we'll do is just give that old medicine more of a chance to kick in. Let it start working its magic on you. And then we'll have you come back to school when your legs have cleared up. What do you think about that plan? Rob stared down at his legs. He felt the picture of the tiger burning in his pocket. He concentrated on keeping his heart from singing out loud with joy. Yes, sir, he said slowly. That would be all right. That's right, said Mr. Felmer. I thought you would think it's a good plan. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just write your parents, uh, I mean your father, a note and tell him what's what. He can give me a call if he wants. We can talk about it. Yes, sir, said Rob again. He kept his head down. He was afraid to look up. Mr. Felmer cleared his throat and scratched his head and adjusted his piece of hair, and then he started to write. When he was done, he handed the note to Rob. Rob took it, and when he was outside the principal's office, he folded the piece of paper up carefully and put it in his back pocket with the drawing of the tiger. And then finally, he smiled. He smiled because he knew something Mr. Felmer did not know. He knew that his legs would never clear up. He was free. Chapter six. Rob floated through the rest of the morning. He went to math class and civics and science, his heart light, buoyed by the knowledge that he would never have to come back. At lunch, he sat out on the benches in the breezeway. He did not go into the lunchroom. Norton and Billy Threemonger were there, and nothing had tasted good to him since his mother died, especially not the food at the school. It was worse than the food his father tried to cook. He sat on the bench and unfolded his drawing of the tiger, and his fingers itched to start making it in wood. He was sitting like that, swinging his legs, studying the drawing, when he heard shouting and the high-pitched buzz of excitement, like crickets, that the kids made when something was happening. He stayed where he was. In a minute, the faded red double doors of the lunchroom swung open, and Sistine Bailey came marching through them, her head held high. Behind her was a whole group of kids, and just when Sistine noticed Rob sitting there on the bench, one of the kids threw something at her. Rob couldn't tell what, but it hit her, whatever it was. Run, he wanted to tell her, yell at her. Hurry up and run. But he didn't say anything. He knew better than to say anything. He just sat and stared at Sistine with his mouth open, and she stared back at him. Then she turned and walked back into the group of kids like somebody walking into deep water. And suddenly, she began swinging with her fist. She was kicking. She was twirling. Then the group of kids closed in around her, and she seemed to disappear. Rob stood up so that he could see her better. He caught sight of her pink dress. It looked all crumpled, like a wadded-up tissue. He saw her arms still going like mad. Hey! he shouted, not meaning to. Hey! he shouted again louder. He moved closer, the drawing of the tiger still in his hand. Leave her alone, he shouted, not believing that the words were coming from him. They heard him then and turned to him. It was quiet for a minute. Who are you talking to? A big girl with black hair asked. Yeah, another girl said. Who do you think you're talking to? Go away, Sistine muttered in her gravelly voice, but she didn't look at him. Her yellow hair was stuck to her forehead with sweat. The girl with the black hair pushed up close to him and she shoved him. Leave her alone, Rob said again. You going to make me? The black-haired girl said. They were all looking at him, waiting. Sistine was waiting too, waiting for him to do something. He looked down at the ground and saw what they had thrown at her. It was an apple. He stared at it for what seemed like a long time. And when he looked back up, they were all still waiting to see what he would do. And so he ran. And after a minute, he could tell that they were running after him. He didn't need to look back to see if they were there. He knew it. He knew the feeling of being chased. He dropped the picture of the tiger and ran full out, pumping his legs and arms hard. They were still behind him. A sudden thrill went through him when he realized that what he was doing was saving Sistine Bailey. Why he would try to save Sistine Bailey, why he would want to save somebody who hated him, he couldn't say. He just ran and the bell rang before they caught him. 
He was late for his English class because he had to walk from the gym all the way to the front of the school, and he did not know where his drawing of the tiger was. But he still had Mr. Felmer's note in his back pocket, and that was all that truly mattered to him. The note that proved that he would never have to come back.